Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, for the sunshine, for uh, this time to gather. We give thanks to you that our coronavirus numbers continue to uh, improve in our, in our community. We give thanks to you uh, for the mediums uh, here that we have the, to be able to meet together, even though separated by distance. We pray, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you would lead us in your word in this time. And would you fix our eyes on Jesus? King Jesus, help us to see you, to know you and love you, that we might love like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Review. Who are we? Why are we here? What are we supposed to be doing with our lives, our energy, our time, talents, and treasures? Um, and we're looking at the offices of prophet, priest, and king to help us. We've been looking at each prophet, priest, and king through three lenses, first from the Old Testament, then Jesus, uh, and then us. Last week, uh, we finished looking at king in the Old Testament. And uh, so today, we're going to look at Jesus as king. Um, and no matter what, we have to finish because next week is our last week. And I want to get to us as kings. So uh, Jesus as king. We looked at, As we looked at the Old Testament kings, we saw kings... Uh, on earth reflected God's kingship, and we see both uh, in God and in his uh, um, ideal earthly king that a king protects his people, provides for his people, and rules with wisdom, love, and justice. So today we're going to look at Jesus as king, and first thing I want to do is go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the, the story after the resurrection of Jesus and then his ascension. The disciples are waiting for the Holy Spirit. We looked a little bit at that when we looked at our role as prophet. Um, and then as, uh, as all the apostles began to preach the gospel in, in different languages, um, then Peter stands up uh, and begins to explain what's happening. Uh, because a lot of people are like, wait a minute, are these guys drunk? What's the deal? And he says, no, this was to fulfill what God had promised, that after Jesus, we'd all receive the Holy Spirit in a way the prophets, priests, and kings did in the Old Testament. Um, and as part of his sermon, we're verse uh, 22. Um, Acts 2, 22. Would, would somebody read that for us? Acts 2, 22 to 36. You get a volunteer to read. Great. Nate, Nate's going to read. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is in my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. 36. Oh, yeah. about 26? I Sorry. Volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <we're trying. laughs> for you will not abandon my soul to Hades. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hound of heaven the hound of heaven <laughs> or let your holy one see corruption you've made known to me the paths of life he will make me full of gladness with your presence brothers i may say to you with confidence about the patriarch david that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, 
the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Nate, thank you so much. I know it's a, a long text. Uh, so, so a couple of things, then we'll jump uh, a little more into that text. In Matthew 25, 31, Matthew 25, 31, you can just write it down, Matthew 25, 31, we see Jesus understands himself as reigning on the throne. We see Jesus understanding himself as a king. In Colossians 1, 13, Colossians 1, 13, in Revelation 1, 9, Revelation 1, 9, we see that the kingdom of God belongs to the Son, and, and the language in Colossians 1 and Revelation 1 says, if you belong to Jesus, you belong to, and here's the language Colossians uses, you belong to the kingdom of the Son, right? It talks about Jesus in language of kingship. And that's what we have happening in Acts chapter 2. From the very beginning, right after the ascension of Jesus Christ, we see his apostles understand him as this is the descendant of David who will rule on David's throne. We see already, they understand all the promises right here in Acts chapter 2. So I took the time to read the, this long text. The Apostle Peter is making this argument, says, look, you see these prophecy or these, these promises in the Old Testament about David and about God's perfect king. And he's saying, that's who Jesus is. All the promises in the Old Testament of a king who will come and rule and make the world whole again, new again, right again, who will protect, provide, and rule with wisdom and love and justice, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's what's happening in Acts chapter 2. Jesus is king. And as king, we expect then, uh, we saw this in the Old Testament, that God as the warrior God, the divine warrior, he fights for his people. He wields a bow, he wields a sword, he wields arrows, and he fights for his people. We see that in God's king as a representative also of God's rule, God's earthly king, was to fight for his people, protect his people. And then even as, we, as you move through the Old Testament and we get into the period of the exile, we see this promise, this expectation of a future king, a king like David, a king like God, who will come again and bring peace from our enemies. This is the role of the king, going to bring peace to God's people by conquering their enemies. That's what it means to protect their people. Well, then you get into the New Testament. The New Testament makes clear that our true enemies are not people, but they're spiritual, right? Ephesians 6, for example, for uh, our war is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers of darkness in this world. Um, and so let's go to Colossians chapter 2. The New Testament makes clear that our true enemies are spiritual enemies, and so when we get to Colossians chapter 2, we see already Jesus is king. We see our enemies are spiritual. We see this expectation from the Old Testament that when God's king comes, he will protect us from our enemies. Colossians 2, 6 through 15. Who wants to read? It's a shorter verse. Uh, I would only do that to Nate. Shorter verse, 6 to 15. Yeah, Maggie, thank you. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you by takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trans trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. The, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in death. Thank you, Maggie. So, so you can see here in Colossians 
chapter two, already this language of the authority of Christ, right? Verse nine, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. You've been filled with him who is the head of all rule and authority. This is the language of, of kingship, of rule, of power, of authority. And then we get to verse 15 and look what it says. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame, triumphing over them in him. So if you think about the ancient world, you think about the conquering of an enemy. Sometimes you might have an enemy come in and um, you've conquered them and you might bring their king in. He'll lay down and you'd place your foot on his neck, right? As this, this demonstration that you have triumphed. Or sometimes you might capture them and you're leading the prisoners, right? Stripped, naked, tied up strung along in ropes and chains, brought into the city. Everyone's laughing and mocking them. Th th this is the language that's being used here. This is what Jesus did through his death and resurrection to the powers of darkness. He has totally disarmed them. He has conquered them. And the power of the devil has no authority over God's people. Revelation 12 is this picture. Right? The, this war of, of the angels with the dragon over, over the baby. It's a picture in just a couple of verses of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And we see through Christ's resurrection, uh, the casting out of Satan from uh, the heavens. So Jesus says that in his earthly ministry, Luke 10, Luke 10, 18, the, the disciples are running around and they're casting out demons and, and they're spreading the gospel. And Jesus says... I saw Satan fall like lightning, right? It's this statement of, of Satan has been defeated through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has conquered our spiritual enemies, and he protects us from them. Um, the, the end of 1 Thessalonians, it's the benediction that I used this morning, and we'll probably use for, for a lot of our Lent season, 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, right? Keeping your whole spirit, souls, and bodies blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who keeps us still, right? That's why we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Um, Jesus' prayer in John 17 says, verse 12, and I've prayed uh, and none are lost. Jesus says, I have lost none that you have given to me, um, except, of course, Judas, that your plans might be fulfilled. Verse 15, then Jesus himself says, keep them from the evil one. What we see in Jesus's uh, resurrection is the defeat of the powers of darkness. And we see in his intercession, this preserving power of protecting us from the powers of the darkness and from Satan. Um, and, uh, and, and this is part of his role as king. As king, he protects us. Threw a lot of verses out. Um, I know there's a short amount of time here, but time for questions. What, where did I speak too fast or not clear? Jesus protects us by conquering our spiritual enemies and preserving us until the end. All right, he protects us. And he provides for us. Um, let's, let's all turn to Revelation 21 and 22. But if I could get somebody to read 2 Corinthians 12, three verses, 8 through 10. 2 Corinthians 12, who would be willing to read? 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. <laughs> I'll do it. Jane, thank you. And then I need somebody to read Philippians 4, 10 through 13. Four verses. Yeah, Dan, thank you. Great. Uh, everyone else, uh, let's go to Revelation 21 and 22. So as king, Jesus protects us. As king, Jesus provides for us. Now, this is a little tricky here as we think about this because Sometimes in this life, we endure really hard things, right? There are times when we endure job loss, child loss, childlessness, um, singleness. Um, th these, these things are like, this seems like it's good and a blessing, and why don't I get it? Or this feels really hard, and I feel like I'm without. Why is that? So that's tricky as we navigate God's perfect provision, and also his sometime allowing us to go through hard things, which is actually a provision of his mercy and grace as he strengthens us in his grace. 
So provision does not mean that uh, you're going to be uh, necessarily healthy, wealthy, and wise all the time, right? Um, it is, first of all, a spiritual provision um, that God gives to us. And he promises, King Jesus promises to strengthen us and to give us everything that we need to persevere until the end. And that's the key here. If our real enemies are spiritual, then our real needs are spiritual also. Not, not to diminish our physical God cares about our bodies, um, but this is, first of all, about our spiritual needs. So 2 Corinthians 12, uh, Jane, 8 through 10. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So, the, oops, sorry. Please. Get one more? Yep, yep, yep. Sorry. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, so this is the, the part where, where the Apostle Paul is talking about a um, likely a physical malady that he's been uh, dealing with. He says, three times I prayed to the Lord to take it away, and he didn't because he says, my grace is sufficient for you um, in your weakness. He says, when I'm weak, I'm strong, so I rejoice in hardship. I rejoice in tribulation. I rejoice when in persecution because I'm experiencing the power, uh, the strength, the endurance of the Lord who enables me to, to persevere. This is what we pray when, um, if, you listen, if you were with us in our Vesper service last Wednesday, or, or I think I prayed it um, at some point in the first service, this prayer I, I found recently from the Book of Common Worship. It says, Lord, you have brought us uh, safely to this new day. And now by your Holy Spirit, would you preserve us so that we might not fall into sin or, become, or, or, or be overcome by adversity? Right? It, it's, this, it's this prayer of, I need the Holy Spirit to help me make it through so I don't sin, or so when I go through hardship, I don't abandon the faith. Um, and, and the Apostle Paul is reminding us, Jesus provides that. He provides all that we need to persevere. Uh, same thing we see in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, who's reading that? Dan's reading that. Philippians 4, 10 through 13, please. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that... Uh, Sorry, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So the Apostle Paul is writing to this church that's, that's giving him financial support um, and, and encouragement. They sent this gift by Epaphrodites who, who sent him, um, uh, brought the gift from the Philippian church. Uh, to the Apostle Paul, and he's writing them back to say, look, this is really awesome, but y'all are too poor to be giving to me. Like, what are you doing? Um, and he's trying to find this way to tactfully encourage them to take care of themselves, but also express appreciation for his gifts. And in the midst of that, he says, um, I've been in times where I didn't have anything. And I've been in times where I had everything. And the secret here is our trust in Jesus. The secret here is a heart that is satisfied in Jesus. My king supplies everything that I need to make it through this world. This is a spiritual provision of heart strength, of courage, of endurance, and of perseverance. I mean, it's a spiritual provision. And of course, God also, you know, he often provides for us physically. I, I can tell you stories of my own upbringing of uh, times when, when our family had nothing and there's a knock at the door and, and someone brought a bag of groceries. It was like God cares about those things also. Um, in fact, he cares so much about those things. Now we're to Revelation 21 and 22. But his, his long-term promise is a day is coming when we will have no wants. A day is coming when we will lack nothing. This is the promise of Revelation chapter 21 
and 22. It's a promise of Jesus coming again, healing the world, make it whole again, new again, right again. Revelation 21. Verse 1, saw new heaven, new earth, first heaven, first earth passed away, see no more, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, he will dwell with them, they will be his people, God himself will be with them as their God, God rules here in the midst of his people in this new world, so wipe away every tear from their eyes, our emotional needs are satisfied. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, crying, pain anymore. Our physical needs are met, because the former things have passed away. He who's seated on the throne, right? Here's the kingship language. Behold, I'm making all things new. He's bringing peace to his people. Write this down. This is trustworthy and true. It's done. I'm the alpha, the omega, right? He finishes. I'm the beginning and the end. Here we go. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Here's the language you heard Jesus say this at, at the well, right? With my, with my living water, you'll never thirst again. And the woman at the well, she says, <laughs> sir, where's this water, <laughs> right? I don't want to have to be going back and forth to the well all the time. I don't want to always have to be worrying about, about where, where are we going to get water in a drought? Where are we going to get food when everything dries up? Where are we going to have provisions when marauders come in? This promise of living water, it's not just about eternal life. It's about never having physical needs anymore. That everything's provided. The world is, is as it should be, and you have enough. You, you keep reading. We see it at the end of chapter 22 or 21. There's no temple in the city. Its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light. Its lamp is the lamb. By light will the nations walk. The kings of the earth bring their glory into it. Verse 25, the gates are never shut by day. There's no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the lamb's book of life. There's a promise here, right? Why this language of no night? It's because in the ancient world, they didn't have electricity, right? All bad things happen in the darkness, right? You're traveling along, you're, you're, you're going for a walk between cities and, and you left too late and the sun goes down. There's robbers, there's invaders, um, there's wild animals, right? This is a promise that, that you're going to be safe in God's city. You don't have to fear for your safety. You don't have to worry about your kids, right? Getting a driver's license and driving for the first time and you don't sleep, uh, right, for the next years or maybe you never sleep after that. My kids aren't old enough yet. And you're always worried about it. I'm like, you are always worried about your kids, aren't you, Vicky? <laughs> it doesn't stop, right? You don't have to worry about your kids in eternity, right? They're gonna be safe. The, the gate's never shut. Why do you shut the gate of a city? To keep people out because you don't want them coming in and, and molesting your property or your people or whatever. The gate's not shut because you're safe, right? There's no fear of invaders. There's no fear of loss. Um, you're not gonna ever be lied to. Nobody who does what is false or detestable will never be taken advantage of again. You get into chapter 22, uh, the, the language continues. This is picking up the language from uh, the book of Ezekiel. The angel showed me the river, the water of life, flowing from the throne of God and the lamb through the middle of the street of the city on either side, the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit. Why 12 kinds of fruit? Because every, what's that? Well, you got that, sure. Yep, 12 is a significant number. Why else? 12 tribes, 12 apostles. How about 12 months of the year, right? There's always food. You never have to do without right? Everybody's flourishing, right? Yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations. There's nothing cursed. The throne is there. They see his face. Night is no more. You don't need a lamp. You don't need a sun because everybody is safe. Everybody is flourishing. Everyone has enough. There's no scarcity in eternity. You see that? This is the provision of our king. He's providing for us now to make it through until the end. And then that day is coming when we will all have enough. No scarcity, no fear, no pain, no bad guys. All is well.
That's a, that's the provision of our king. Thoughts, comments, questions before we look at his rule? Something you didn't hear, I went too fast. I'm mindful of that, I'm like, okay, I gotta get all this in 30 minutes. I, I, have, I, have, a, I have a certain person's voice in the back of my head, like, Chris, slow down! <laughs> I'm like, I only got 30 minutes. All right, let's look at his wise, loving, and just rule. Uh, what text are, are, are we gonna turn to? Um, for wisdom, let's go to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. We see after Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, what, what happens? What happens at Jesus' ascension? He's returning to his father's throne, right? He's exalted again. This is Philippians chapter two. Um, after he humbles himself, becoming in the likeness of, of sinful flesh, being humbled even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, therefore what? God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee bows, right? In allegiance, in loyalty, in acknowledgement as the king. In Revelation, we see his name. What is the title that's put on him? He is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is exalted as the supreme ruler of the universe. And, and then you add to this, right? Jesus's deity, his divine nature, means he shares equality with the Father. And that means everything we can say about the Father in terms of attributes, we can say about the Son, uh, right? Everything we can say about the Father in terms of attributes wise, loving, good, perfect, holy, right? We can say about the Son. And it means everything we say about God as King in the Old Testament, we say as Jesus as King. This includes his wisdom we see in the Old Testament, his love we see in the Old Testament, his justice we see in the Old Testament. And so for our purposes and, and leading us into to next week, us as kings, what I want to do the rest of our time is only look at Jesus's earthly ministry and how he models humanity's call to rule on the earth. So let me say that again slowly. Jesus, as God, and as king, shares all the attributes of God as king. In his divine nature, everything we said about God as king uh, last week, you can say about Jesus as king. Jesus also models for us perfect humanity, what humanity was designed to be created to be. You read through Hebrews and we see this as uh, he is the fulfillment of Hebrews, or, of, of Psalm 8, uh, right? Filled with glory and honor. He's the model, right? This is what humanity was designed to be. And so when we look at how Jesus models wisdom, love, and justice, he's actually modeling that for us as we demonstrate God's rule over the earth with wisdom, with love, with justice. We'll talk about this a lot more next week, but I just want to see Jesus and his earthly ministry characterized by wisdom, love, and justice. So Luke chapter 2, two verses, 39 to 40. Would somebody read that for us? Luke 2, 39 and 40. Yes, Larry, thank you. And the woman has performed everything according to the law of the Lord and returned into Galilee, her own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Good. So, so here we are. Uh, Jesus was in the temple. His parents are, are looking for him. They go and find him. They come back. Jesus is presented at the temple a certain age. And, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, previous to that, they take him to be circumcised, and they do everything that they're supposed to do because they're 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 good uh, Jewish uh, observers, and they come back, and then the text says, and Jesus grew and became strong, and he's filled with wisdom, and you see that in his teaching ministry. Uh, you see all throughout Jesus's teaching ministry, he's affirmed as as wise. Right? So, for example, um, read through the, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We see Jesus expounding the scriptures, and affirming and proclaiming truth from God's word. And then what happens at the very end? If you go read Matthew 5 through 7, at the very end, the, the text says the people were marveling. They said, this man teaches with authority, not like our teachers. Right? They're marveling at Jesus' wisdom 
and at his authority. We see Jesus is shrewd, right? Jesus is shrewd over and over and over. The Pharisees and, and, and Sadducees, they try to trap Jesus in conversation, right? They're like, so teacher, woman marries a man and he dies. And so she marries his brother and he dies. And this goes on for a while. So when they get to heaven, who does the woman marry, right? They're, they're trying to trap Jesus. Woman con adultery, Jesus. Who, who, what should be done, right? And they're like, uh, and, and Jesus is shrewd enough to say, well, the husband's not there. And, and says things like, whichever of you is not guilty of any sin, go ahead and throw the first stone, right? This is Jesus' shrewdness. It's his, it's his wisdom uh, that he demonstrates uh, through his earthly ministry. He speaks truth. He speaks it with love. He speaks it uh, 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 with, with shrewdness. Um, uh, we see his ministry characterized by love. Let's look at John 11. It's ministry characterized by wisdom. It's characterized by love. You'll know the story in John 11. Jesus, uh, his friend Lazarus dies. And so they finally come. Jesus has, has stayed with his disciples. His friend dies. And so the disciples and Jesus all go back to Bethany. And when they get there, I'm, I'm around verse, uh, verse 30. Jesus hadn't come yet. Verse 31, the, the Jews are in there consoling her. Mary gets up and goes out. They follow her, thinking she's going to the tomb to weep. 32, Mary comes to Jesus. She fell to his feet. Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, what does it say there? He was deeply moved. But it doesn't just say this once, right? We get to, we keep going in the story. He's deeply moved in spirit. He's greatly troubled. He said, where did you lay him? They said, look and see. Verse 35, he weeps. Verse 36, the Jews say, look how he loved him. And of course, there's always the, the haters. And they're like, well, I, you know, they could have they kept this guy alive. Um, verse 38, Jesus, look what it says again. Deeply moved again when he gets to the tomb. Jesus' heart is overcome with emotion. Why? Because he really loves Lazarus, right? Lazarus just isn't this tool to show his power to raise him from the dead. Like, Jesus cares about this man. His heart is deeply moved when he sees Mary and Martha, these women that he loves. They're weeping, and his heart breaks. He comes to a funeral procession, and he hears the wailing, and his heart is grieved, right? This is, this is Jesus's compassion for the hurting you see it in in his in in john 15 if you turn the page uh john 15 i'm the true vine and the true branches he says abide in me what's he say then in verse 9 he's like i'm the true vine you're the branches abide in me so that you can bear much fruit if you read verse 9 look what he says as the father has loved me so have i loved you let me think about that for just a moment. As the Father loves the Son, so Jesus loves his people. I mean, that, that's, really, I mean that, that's really profound to see the eternal Father's love for the eternal Son. That same love bestowed by Jesus on his people. Verse 13, he says, in, in case you miss this, right? No greater love than this, when a man lays down his life for his friends. I, I love it. I get for some people it's cheesy, but the, the you know, t-shirts and posters, um, Jesus, how much do you love me? He says this much, right? Because he stretches his hands out on the cross. Like that's Jesus's love for us. If you go to Romans 8, we're, we're not going to turn there, but at the end, I love this text, right? Um, I, I am convinced in neither height nor depth nor angels nor demons nor, nor anything past or present. Nothing can separate us from what? The love of God through Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul says, right? God's love comes to us through Jesus. This love is lived out in his ministry, his compassion for sinners and prostitutes, his tenderness to Zacchaeus. There's this old man in the tree, right? And he comes up and says, look, you just want to see us? Come down, Zacchaeus. And, and he says, I'm, I'm going to have dinner at your house, right? There, there's tenderness, there's compassion, there's love. Um, in John chapter 6, the, 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 the people, there's this crowd following Jesus, 
and they're hungry, right? And he turns to his disciples and says, yeah, yeah what, what, what bread do you have? Because we got it, we got it. And the disciples are like, Jesus, just send the people home. It's not about sending them home hungry. Why? Because he cares about them, right? It's not, it's not just an opportunity for Jesus to say, hey, y'all, watch this. Oh, look at the power I have, right? It's, it's actually motivated by his love for his people. These are acts of love and mercy and compassion. And they're acts of justice, right? Jesus cares for the outcast, for the orphans, for the widows, for the least of these. Um, we see justice in Jesus' promise for justice against those who persecute his people. Um, we see his, his justice uh, in, in his provision uh, for that. So let's, let's look at final justice. Um, you write down Revelation 6, 9 through 11. This is when the, when the saints are under the altar. And it's this picture of martyrs, people who have died because of their faith in Jesus. And you hear their cry out. Their cry is, how long, O Lord? Not until we see the world new. Not how long until uh, we get to go to the new earth. It says, how long until you avenge our blood? One of the things that King Jesus does is he brings justice against the people who have oppressed his people. For those who have persecuted Christ and his church um, and his people, there is a reckoning uh, at the end of time. And this justice, uh, that's, that's spiritual end time justice we're looking at his ministry, this justice advocating for the weak, the abused, the oppressed, it's demonstrated in his earthly ministry. Again, you can just look at the people he spends time with. They're the people who are rejected, right? The prostitutes and the sinners and, and the people that the religious leaders didn't want to have anything to do with. And he advocates for them, right? He, he fights for them. Um, so let's look at maybe, maybe one text. Uh, we can talk about the other, Luke 11. Luke 11. Luke eleven forty two. Luke eleven four forty two. So here, here he is. What I want you to see here is Jesus advocate, right? He doesn't just spend time with the, the weak and the outsider and the abused and the oppressed. He actually advocates for them. Look what he says to the religious leaders. Woe to you Pharisees, verse 42. You tithe mint and rue and every herb, but you neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, right? You love the best seat in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace. But you're uh, like unmarked graves and people who walk over them without knowing it. He's rebuking the Pharisees, right? They love their wealth. They love their prominence. They love for people to congratulate them when they walk through the town. He said, you, you've totally forgot what it means to be my people, about loving others, about caring for people about advocating. We see this in Matthew 21. We won't turn there, but uh, in Matthew's version of Jesus cleansing the temple, one of the things that, that's happening there in the temple is, is, and there's all kinds of things happening, but one of the things is as you, as you travel to Jerusalem, there are certain sacrifices you're supposed to offer every year. And so you travel to Jerusalem uh, and, and you bring all these sacrifices with you, uh, and that makes the travel really hard, right? If you ever fly with uh, little kids, you have like a hundred more suitcases, right? Um, how awesome would it be if you could just pay when you get to your destination and they have all your stuff for you? Well, so the, the, the money changers do, they say, you know what? We'll provide the animals, you just bring the cash. And of course, there's gonna be a little extra fee to jack up the prices, it's a convenience fee, right? Um, and, and so what they're doing is, is they're taking advantage of the travelers. They're money changing, right? You, you need local currency and they jack up the, the conversion rate, right? Th think, about, think about our economy. Um, real careful, we're not gonna dabble into politics. So just smooth your shackles here, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Nate and I have lots of fun political conversations. When we talk about what something is worth in our economy, what do we say, right? Whatever someone is willing to pay. That can be really easily uh, oppression, right? You need this. Uh, we call it price gouging, right? Well, that's what it's worth. People are going to pay it. Um, and we take advantage of people because of something they need. Jesus says this can become robbery. That's what he says in Matthew. This is injustice. 
right? At the temple, these money changers and pigeon sellers, they're taking advantage of folks and Jesus drives them out. So it's King, this isn't the way the King Jesus rules. He rules with wisdom. He rules with love. He rules with justice. And so what I want us to see th this morning, uh, see Jesus as King. He protects his people, especially against spiritual enemies through conquering those spiritual enemies and through his final conquering of them at the end of time, casting them into the lake of fire. We see Jesus provide. He provides all that we need in him, especially our, our spiritual stamina and strength to make it till the end as we await that last day when he gives us everything. And we see Jesus as king. We see his wise, loving, and just rule as God. We, all that we said about God is true of King Jesus. And in his earthly ministry, we see his life modeling what true human ministry should look like. Wisdom from God's word, a shrewdness love and compassion for hurting people, justice and advocacy for the oppressed. Last comments, questions. I know that was a race. I'm sorry that's uh, my own uh, failure to not keep us on track earlier so we had a little more time, didn't have to rush so much, but. Last comments, questions. Everything's clear as mud. Yeah, Phil. <laughs> What's that, Maggie? Yeah, you go home, watch it again, maybe at half, watch it at like half speed. <laughs> Phil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Um, no, that that's great. So, and that's why you gotta, it, it, how do I answer this really shortly? One of the things I try to, 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 to help when I get the opportunity to teach people how to read scripture is, of course, history is led by God and he's sovereign over it. Um, but history isn't inspired in the same way the word of God is, right? So that's the, it's the word of God that is inspired by God to teach us. And, and one of the dangers we have when we read through the gospel accounts is we say, well, Matthew says this, and Mark says this, and Luke says this, so we try to piece together what happened in history, and we preach the historical story. And, and I think we miss something when we don't stay in the text. Matthew's trying to communicate something particular. Mark's trying to communicate something. Luke's trying to communicate something. In Luke's, in Luke's gospel, the cleansing of the temple, the emphasis is um, is on this fact that, that actually where they are is in the court of the Gentiles, and they're filling up this place where the Gentile um, believers, because you know if you weren't if you weren't truly Jewish, you couldn't go all the way into the temple, but you worship from kind of the gate, um, from in this outside court, the court of the Gentiles. Um, but because they had set up all those booths there, they they actually were keeping Gentiles away from uh, from worship. And you remember that Luke's writing uh, likely to a Gentile, to Theophilus, is that was a Greek name. And I think part of the point there is he's saying Jesus was bringing in the nations. And so in Luke, the rebuke is you're preventing people from accessing God. In Matthew, written much more to a largely uh, Jewish audience, the, um, the emphasis there is much more, and this was supposed to be a place of worship. Um, I think there's, there's um, where this comes in Matthew, it's, it's this um, aspect on, on, on King Jesus and his advocacy for the people that the Jewish leaders had been neglecting. And so I think we're meant to see there at least part, there's a lot of other things happening there, but in part, they're taking advantage of, of the travelers, of, of the impoverished, of the people um, who are outside Jerusalem. Um, and so it, it depends on which account you, you're reading. So I don't think we're sinning by buying communion juice <laughs> we might next week when we start charging for them but, but the elders haven't approved that yet just, just kidding just kidding <laughs> that's a great question anybody else before we wrap up thanks next week hopefully we'll have a little bit more time we're going to look at our role as kings to wrap up our class maybe we'll have just a moment for summary um, and try to have fewer texts just so we can really, uh, so we have some time to dialogue because uh, I think we'll have some things to wrestle through. Um, but what I want us to see next week is, okay, so God is king. 
God has appointed earthly kings in the Old Testament to represent his kingship. Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And through Jesus, God's restoring us to how we were created. We were made to fill and subdue the earth. What does it mean to model God's rule on the earth? And we'll see, I think it means protecting, providing, um, demonstrating God's wisdom, love, and justice. So that's what we'll look at next week. Let's pray. God, thanks for this time together. I pray that you would um, seal some of these things into our heart, even though we raced through them, that you would give us time today and this week to reflect in them, that you would help us to see King Jesus, and that you might help us see who we are in Jesus, modeling your protection, your provision, your wisdom, your love, your justice to this world that longs for a true king. Would we show that to this world by living and loving like Jesus? We pray in his name. Amen. All right. Thanks so much, friends.